Hello. This year, we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the New York City Housing Court. As part of our commemoration, we have done interviews with many people that have been involved with the Housing Court, both in its formation, its implementation, its advancement, up until today. Many of the people we've interviewed have been administrators, lawyers, judges, and people who have had a very long experience with our court. I hope you will enjoy what you see, and we hope at some time in the future to have a full-length documentary about the housing court. My involvement with the housing part of the civil court, as it's officially known, uh, came about almost by accident, as many things in life do. I was practicing uh, law and had been involved in the development of Mitchell-Lama housing and artists in residence and many aspects of housing. And I used to go into the criminal court, which is where housing violations originally were heard by criminal court judges who clearly had no appreciation or understanding, it seemed to many of us, of what was really going on in terms of housing violations. And so they treated them very superficially and never were really successful in getting housing violations corrected. And that seemed to be something of importance to many of us. And I learned that the city of Baltimore had uh, come up with a housing court. I went down there and saw how they were operating, and then Boston came along too and had another var variation of it. Um, and I did a little bit more investigation and found that several years prior to that involvement by me, uh, Professor Frank Grad up at Columbia with the Legislative Drafting Fund had uh, written some legislation or proposed a housing court for the city. And uh, so I put that in the back of my head and then I was taking a doctorate at the time after I'd gotten a master's at NYU Law School and there were no more courses for me to take at NYU, so I went to New York Law School and uh, proceeded to take a doctorate and had to write a thesis. And my th thesis included the idea of a housing court. Uh, I spoke with the Community Service Society and other agencies who all had ideas, and so I filtered those into uh, the uh, thesis that I did, and ultimately, or concomitantly with it, I uh, became special counsel to the minority leader of the New York State Assembly, Stanley Steingut, and uh, uh, also became his housing consultant. One day, I went to the housing committee meeting of the New York State Assembly and I heard a proposal for an administrative tribunal that Governor Rockefeller, for whom I must say I had, I came to have very high regard, even though I was a Democrat, um, I found that uh, he was genu genuinely interested in preserving the housing stock for the city of New York. And he had before his desk, or in front, of, or on his desk, a proposal by Senator Roy Goodman, and I'm mentioning these names because they all figure very prominently uh, in what has turned out to be the housing court for the city of New York. Roy had a bill for an administrative tribunal, and it was, at that time, the, considered the governor's bill. Well, at this housing committee meeting of the assembly, when I heard about an administrative tribunal, I said in my typical uh, fashion, 
oh no. And the Republican chairman of the committee uh, looked over at me and he said, all right, you got a better idea? And I don't want to sound uh, feminine about it, but I said, well, yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. And he said, what is that? And I said, a housing court. And he looked at me over his glasses and said, okay, over Easter you can come in with a bill. And I said, I will, um, naive as I was. And I spent my Easter vacation uh, putting together all the ideas that I had accumulated over a period of time. And when the session resumed, I had a bill. Everybody thinks that they're doing a, you know, a big favor by giving them summary proceedings. Actually, it's the other way around. Before they had the civil court, the, uh, the landlord and tenant court, there was no court at all. And landlords would just take possession if they wanted it. And if they were wrong, they'd sue them later. So the idea was to put them under control so that people get a chance to test the, the correctness of their position and we'd eliminate the abuses of uh, illegal evictions and everything. So in order to get them, there were no court at all. They said, well, we'll give you a fast track. It'll only be 10 days and there'll be a court. And so they got a speedy, uh, speedy proceedings evolving to landlord and tenant court. In the beginning, the, it was a court where landlords went to recover possession of property, either for non-payment, expiration of the tenancy, whatever it was. Landlord proved his case, he got what he wanted, and that was it. My experience as to what was going on in landlord-tenant court in the Bronx specifically, and I'm sure in other boroughs, even before legal services appeared on the scene and with tenants really had no representation at all. Uh, in the Bronx, uh, there was one judge who was assigned to landlord-tenant. The judge heard both commercial and residential cases, heard all cases. The calendar in landlord-tenant court in the Bronx on a typical day was finished before one o'clock. Most cases were defaulted. There was an enormous problem of sewer service. Uh, in addition, as we know, there was no warranty of habitability, okay, as part of the law. So the tenants who did appear would appear without an attorney because obviously most tenants could not afford an attorney. And by one o'clock, they would have had a final judgment. Uh, if there were repairs which were necessary, the judge may tell the landlord, do the repairs, uh, make sure you do the repairs, but ultimately, very few tenants walked out of that court without a judgment. If a judge did one trial, nothing else happened in that courtroom that day. Politically, the housing court was created uh, as a result of the situation which I just described, uh, in which tenants were represented, there were not enough judges to cover the cases. As a result, cases were not moving. So I believe that initially, I, I believe, it was formed because of pressure created by the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. But subsequently, it serves the second purpose that you said, which means it served a greater purpose, obviously, than the intended purpose. The intended purpose was to collect rent as much as, as quickly as possible. But ultimately, obviously, the housing court has served an important function in maintaining the housing court and making sure the tenants' rights are preserved, landlords' rights and tenants' rights are preserved. Well, my bulk of the experience was, as I said earlier, in Brooklyn at the time, with some maybe a quarter of it being in Queens. No Manhattan experience, so I don't know what Manhattan was like. I know that Manhattan was different than Brooklyn when I came to Manhattan in the early 70s. Um, so in Brooklyn, it was, did you pay the rent? How much time do you need to leave? And we have to be done by 1 o'clock because we have things to do in the afternoon that don't involve cases or court or you. So that sort of dramatically changed in 73 when the new system came into place. I requested and there was established a panel of attorneys who were volunteers who would work with me. I would assign cases to them. The way it worked was the following, to the best of my recollection, and this is almost 50, 60 years ago, so that recollection is not so sharp. But having been in the housing court, or the equivalent of the same housing part before, um, I tried to set up procedures that would be most effective. 
cutting down on the amount of time that was required to make an adjudication and the amount of time for people to be at the court. I requested that there be volunteers attorneys who are familiar with housing court procedures and the housing court law laws who would work with me every matter in the original housing court was sent to me first the city by an earlier charter had gotten the power to repair private enterprise buildings so the city can go ahead and provide fuel, repair boilers, and what we call today the emergency repair program, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, was unknown at the time, and, and provided a great bulk work for, uh, for tenants who didn't have heat and didn't have hot water. Uh, and other repairs. Uh, when the housing court was first established, the housing judges were considered uh, slightly more than referees, and the, the original, I don't want to say legislation, but the original effect was that the judge sitting in the calendar part uh, assigned that case to the housing judge referee. Uh, the question was, was it to hear and report, uh, or was it for that judge to decide? Uh, in the early days, I think it was presumed it was a hear and report, and the civil court judge who had sent it out would pass on everything. Um, that quickly changed when we were given unlimited authority, and we had contempt powers, and we were considered a court of record, and we were to do everything. But for the longest period of time, part 17 in the Bronx, part 18 in Manhattan, I don't know what they were called in the other counties, which was the calendar part, would also take stipulations on the record. Some, sometimes the tenants would actually have a hard copy of what they had agreed to. Sometimes it was just on a st stenographic record where, where it was handwritten on a file. Um, that moved cases along, and the, the judges who sat in the calendar parts got credit for resolving cases. I, uh, that happened, but as an attorney, uh, you didn't see it. I mean, as, as a tenant's attorney, because if I was on the case, I would not allow a stipulation to be on the record. It would be handwritten traditionally by me uh, or by one of the other tenant's attorneys. Landlord attorneys had so much business that they didn't mind, and they even encouraged the tenant's attorneys to write the stipulations, um, and then they would be most of the time allocated, not necessarily, right, and move on to the next case. It's nothing like it was today. One of the stories that impressed me initially was the lack of concern about the breach of warranty of habitability by the bar. Certainly, many of the judges, before it was enacted in the uh, real property law, had recognized the importance of conditions and premises as being a condition that would affect the payment of rent. I think it was in 1972 that they began to write appellate decisions um, about the breach warranty of habitability before it was enacted in statute. My memory of it was that they were a little worn of rooms mm -hmm. within the main building at 141 Livingston Street, but they were they were horrendous. I don't remember Manhattan being particularly spectacular either with the housing court, and the Bronx was in the basement. I think uh, in certain ways, uh, obvious, it's definitely effective in the sense that it's a specialized court. It's got trained judges. It was a big step up to have judges who actually had a sense about what the law was when the housing court first came into existence, as opposed to, by chance, with the civil court judges who may or may not have had as much experience and knowledge as the housing court judges did. The facilities, as I said, have changed dramatically. When I first started, we had a court officer and a judge, and we had a tape machine that was the size of a locker, um, and every morning the tape machine had to be rolled out, 
set up to be utilized. It was a reel-to-reel tape machine. Uh, you had to put out the microphones. Um, and that was done by the officer. Then the officer checked everybody in. And then uh, the judge conferenced every case, heard arguments on every case, tried every case. And the officer would then make entries into the calendar. All right? And my first courtroom uh, was probably 10 by 15. At most, I had two rows of small benches that I could probably sit 12 people. Uh, the officer's desk was at the entrance to the court. Then there was the judge's bench. And I was one of the lucky few. My courtroom had a bathroom that was utilized by most of the other judges because there were no other private bathrooms to be found. Um, and the people would check in with the officer. The cases would be conferenced by the judge, uh, allocated, and the people be would be sent on their way. I brought in, uh, within the first month or two of my administration, I brought in 20 new housing judges. I received authorization and the funding, 20 new judges, and it became a real court. We were able to put judges in every county. When I took over, you now have computers in the court. You had nothing like computers at that point. Uh, I think uh, I was the first one that brought computers into the courtrooms, which were ultimately adopted by the other parts of the Civil Court, Supreme Court, et cetera. Did the housing court have them first? They were one of the first. Uh, I realized that we're coming to a new age uh, and we just couldn't sit back. Uh, well, I came in uh, during the 1900s. Uh, we were probably in another century uh, as far as the courts were concerned. Uh, I realized something had to be done. And there was a computer show at the old Coliseum up around Columbus Circle. So I and uh, some of the members of the court went with me and uh, we went to that computer show and I saw some of the computers that I thought could be great for the housing parts. Uh, I was able to convince the administration that at least we should experiment and bring some of these computers into the court, uh, which we did. Uh, they realized that not only the housing parts, all the court system had to be modernized as far as us entering the computer age. And uh, I brought the computers in. Uh, we worked out a system where we went into HBD, uh, the Housing Preservation Development Area. We were able to go directly in there with a way of working it out. Uh, the housing judges were able to see uh, within a few minutes the uh, violations mm -hmm. uh, that were on a piece of property and a lot of other things and it eventually developed into something that is being used to this very day. In the early 1980s I came into civil court and at the time I started civil court I think me and Ernie Bell got pretty much started the same exact time. And so what happened was I was assigned to the housing court, it was like the information desk. And so I worked there uh, in New York County for about, I think it seemed like about three, four years before I went to Queens. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I had the opportunity to, I was chosen to go to a meeting that was held in the boardroom on the 12th floor of 111 Center Street. At that meeting, there was three civil court people there. Jerry Dewar, who was the, uh, Deputy Borough Chief for the Bronx, Miles McKenna, who was a, a clerk out in the Civil Court in Kings County, and myself. We did not have any idea what the meeting was about, and so we came to the meeting, and the meeting had about, it must, it seemed like about 80 people at that meeting. It had a very, very big audience. Judge Idra Rubin was administrative judge at that time, so he was the one who constructed that meeting. So at the time, we kind of came in, we were just part of the audience, but it was made up of housing court judges, HPD, OCA, IBM people, and court people like myself. So that was how I kind of segued into the opportunity of 
working on the Housing Court Computer Information System. They were handled in the criminal court where they never should have been, but they were handled there, and once we started the housing parts, they were taken out of the criminal parts and put into the housing court. The then uh, administrative judge, no, uh, administrative, rent administrator, you have a right title, Cordy Gable, uh, asked me to be her executive assistant, and in an ironic sense, having uh, sought for people to get services, I got to write uh, the regulations with regard to the emergency repair program, and became the secretary of the, of the emergency repair program, which worked out very well to my satisfaction. And I'm happy to see that the city uh, has gone through some convoluted steps, but it's using the same program in their new, uh, I put that in quotation marks, uh, program for uh, for an alternative enforcement program, uh, which as far as I can see is nothing but uh, the, the use of the emergency repair program. I think part of the selling point of the Section 110 of the Civil Court Act, which is the enabling section for our court, was many, many paragraphs talked about enforcing code requirements, maintaining and improving the housing stock, and that was part of the argument for setting up the court. Uh, anyone that knows would realize that in the Bronx, there are 15 judges. Uh, there is one housing part. Uh, in Manhattan, I think there are now 12 judges, one HP or housing part where action is going to be commenced. Similarly, in Brooklyn, one part dedicated to it, none in Staten Island, and I believe Queens has an, a, a, a housing part or an HPD part that is part-time. I think it's three days a week. So even though the legislation talked about how important that role of the court would be, uh, I don't believe it's ever come to fruition uh, because of staffing, because of uh, the needs of the other aspects of the court. And there's no question that the largest portion of our cases, <coughs> whether it's in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, is the non-payment of rent. And I don't have statistics. I'm sure somebody, somebody does. But my belief would be between 80 to 85 percent of the court's work is non-payment proceedings. Uh, perhaps uh, 10 percent it would be holdover proceedings and another 10% would be the HP uh, proceedings, whether they be tenant actions or actions commenced by HPD. So although in the enabling legislation and the, one of the selling points would be how much better it would be to maintain the housing and to uh, enforce the law, I'm not sure that that aspect of the law was ever accomplished. HP cases were, were handled in a separate part, and that was more efficient because a lot of times the court would be cluttered up with a very highfalutin, difficult holdover case, and you'd have six people without heat who couldn't get to get called. Um, so I think the administration of justice was fuller at the time um, of that change, and we noticed an appreciable difference. Um, that was, I think, the biggest change. At first, they were just assigned to everybody, and then the administrative judge, I forget if it was Judge Smith or who and he asked me if I would take it. And I got the, all of the HP cases from the Department of Pre Housing Preservation Development, the tenant initiated ones, uh, housing authority, and once in a while I might get a simple case. But for the most part, all those cases from Manhattan came to me. Oh, I thought it was a very, very valuable part of the courthouse, of the court, and I thought the tenant initiated actions were very good uh, 
weapon for people who were suffering to come in on their own. And uh, we got a lot done. I think a lot of houses were saved because we had that part. We, we, I appointed 7A administrators, which was a, a very good tool. And then, of course, the HP, uh, we had no monetary restrictions. $25,000 was the, the limit for civil court. For the housing court, there was no limit. The fines could be anywhere, and sometimes they were. When the tenant brings it back in an HP case, because the landlord didn't do the repairs, very often you find they, well, there were four repairs, they did two, they didn't do the other two. Where there were 10 repairs, they've done six or seven. And you find they actually do get done. And in order of the court where it's backed up by an automatic fine, if the landlord doesn't do the repairs, is actually a very, very powerful tool to get the housing stock maintained. When they first formed the housing court, part of the concept was to join the enforcement parts, which were treated as, frankly, very unimportant parts of the criminal court, with the housing parts, where the same court where landlords sued for rent or possession also enforced housing conditions. So the court actually had the power to require the landlord to do something as opposed to just like paying a small fine like a traffic ticket. Um, if it just becomes a cost of doing business, it's not a very great way to enforce the housing, uh, housing stuff to enforce housing maintenance. Whereas if somebody's gonna really be ordered to do something and it's gonna cost them serious money and maybe a possible contempt motion, they're gonna take it a lot more seriously. I was the administrative judge. Uh, assisted in, you know, developing it, uh, along with Judge Fow and Barbara Millet, mm -hmm. who was in counsel's office then, I believe, and now she's at the Judicial Institute. Um, I was appointed the administrative judge in October of 96. I actually took charge December, of, like late December 1996, and somewhere around mid-January 1997, I was called in by the chief administrative judge who was then our chief, you know, who's now our chief judge, Judge Jonathan Lippman, and he said, we would like to overhaul housing court completely. And that's the start of the initiative. Well, certainly it changed the culture a bit. Um, you know, we eliminated Part 18, part the old Part 49, because it had become Part 18 by then. Um, and so the way cases started changed, and that was a dramatic change. And Part 18, Part 49 had inherent problems. It was always crowded. It was inhumane, I thought, in terms of, you know, people standing and babies crying. I also thought it was, um, uh, at least from my viewpoint, um, some attorneys were able to manipulate where their cases were sent. And so the initiative changed that, eliminated that cattle call uh, calendar part and started the cases, you know, initially with the, the judge that the case was assigned to. I think dividing the task between settlement and trials was um, remarkable, and I believe that came from Judge Fowl. It becomes a little blurry as to who came up with what idea, because it really was a, a report that we worked on together, but I think that came from Judge Fowl. Um, and I think that's made a difference. I think we're much better at trials than we were back in 1996. You know, we get trials done. We don't have the backlog we used to have. You know, if you remember the old days where you could get a trial for one day and it would be another mm, a month or two before you could go back to trial. But we do, you know, not the best job of contigu contiguous trial dates, but mostly contiguous trial dates. And I think that was a major change. Clearly the resources that we put into the court system in terms of access to justice issues changed. You know, um, well my big thing, and I will claim credit for this, is taking the um, formerly known as pro se attorneys from behind windows and putting them into offices where they could sit and actually look at the litigants that they were helping, um, increasing the number of um, pro se attorneys, we call them um, health center attorneys now, mm -hmm. that changed. Um, and I think that made a big difference. The biggest change that I saw is that prior to that, judges for the most part held a case from start to finish. Um, uh, the Supreme Court for years had argued that we should have the system where one judge h handles the case from its inception till its conclusion. I don't know if they still have that. Um, not, not sure. I, yeah, individual assignment system. Um, but that's what the housing court always was. With, with the initiative in 97, 98, mm -hmm. um, they took that away. They set up 
resolution parts, uh, specialty parts, trial parts. <coughs> um, the resolution parts are overwhelmed with work. Uh, it seems to me that in many instances the resolution parts should be permitted and or required uh, to, to take the case from start to finish because they theoretically have more knowledge about what's happened to those cases than somebody who's worked on it for f seven months and then it gets sent out to trial for somebody who has no experience with the case. Uh, so it, I certainly would have advocated if I had been asked to allow an IAS system uh, to defend the bill. Uh, it would appear that trials get disposed of more quickly now because you have dedicated judges who will hear or be ready to hear those cases. Uh, the fact that they are ready to hear those cases generally means there are less actual trials. Uh, the threat of a trial is wonderful, but going to trial, uh, as, you, as we are aware, sometimes is difficult. So it often leads to settlements and resolutions that you might not be able to obtain if it stayed in a resolution part. I also believe that if the, the resolution judges had the tools and power, they could move cases as quickly as the trial judges. There's no real answer for complex trials, though. I was involved in the initiative in the sense that I was the supervising judge in Manhattan, and it was put in. And a lot of my understanding of the initiative um, was to address the problem of how cases moved. And a, a lot of emphasis was placed on the, the fact that the halls, of just, the halls of housing court became the place where, in fact, that was where the practice was occurring. That was, uh, m to my mind, a primary reason for the impl Im implementation. I don't, I think the, ex the extra resources was excellent. I don't think it addressed that, frankly. I think when you go back, the halls are just as crowded today. It's actually distressing. You go back and you think, okay, you've done something, and it turns out nothing, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Um, so I don't, I, I think that effectiveness is not as effective as one would have hoped. There are sort of lots of reasons for that. You know, we don't have enough resources to get everybody out of the court hallways. You know, we put in programs such as RAP to make sure that the, the what goes on in the hallways are more of an even playing field. That helps. Um, but you'd have to have triple, quadruple the number of court attorneys that we have now to actually get everybody out of the hallways. And I mean, to a certain extent, we have to give litigants, um, you know, the right to determine their own destiny and to talk to the other side earlier in the morning so they can possibly get home to their children and jobs. I, we do understand that. But no, we haven't done the best we could possibly do in getting people out of the hallways. I think having separate trial and motion parts is a good idea. Having resolution parts is a good idea. Cases that could settle and can be settled won't take a lot of time away from trials of cases that cannot settle. So the trial judges really have time to try those holdover proceedings, non-primary resident proceedings, owner use proceedings where they just don't want to settle and have reason not to settle as opposed to paint cases where somebody needs time to get the money. And you can settle those usually in the resolution part the separation of the functions is good. And there's another good part about that. When I'm in trial part, I, I conference anything. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely do so much conference on a case that I feel I can't then try it because I know too much, as it were. But if a resolution judge spends a lot of time trying to settle a case and can't, and maybe gets frustrated with either the landlord or the tenant or both, she or he doesn't have to then try the case where the person who they just thought was being unreasonable is going to try to convince that judge that she or he is credible. Initially, when the House, my recollection of Bronx, we had five judges who were basically backup judges, and cases were called in the calendar part and sent out to the judge. They were not sent out for resolution. They were not sent up. They were sent out for all purposes. Mm -hmm. And judges both tried to resolve cases and try cases. I, I believe that, uh, that the, the creation sort of a dual system with resolution and trial you know, does, I think, serves a function. Because, uh, you know, judges and resolution parts would have, more, let me just say, if they had less cases, 
they would have more time to try to conference cases to see if they could be resolved and only send them out to trial if it was necessary to send them out to trial. I think the time has come after 40 years that we took a look at how has this worked? Is it better? Would it have been better to have an administrative tribunal? I mean, I'm, I'm not wedded to my baby. Uh, I'd like to know before the Grim Reaper comes along and puts an end to my thinking about it, uh, about whether I was Don Quixote, was I dreaming, was I naive?